Uh, morning all, uh, welcome. And uh, I thank the uh, organising committee of the IASA for asking me to moderate this first panel. It's a bit daunting, first cab off the rank, but anyway, we'll get through it. Uh, I'd just like to compliment also the uh, organising uh, committee for this. Uh, as you can see, I've got a few years under the belt and uh, this is a very, very well organised and professional, uh, professionally run organisation. So congratulations to all involved. I know a lot of work has gone into it. Uh, and you, you folks are going to reap the benefit of it today. So uh, again, uh, perhaps a round of applause for the organising committee because I think it's worth it. To try and keep on schedule, I'll, I'll keep this brief. Uh, my name's Lance Strong. I've been with, I've been a resident of Ireland for about the last eight years. Obviously, I'm not from Ireland. Uh, I did all my initial training in Australia. My, uh, you guys are on the dawn of your career. I'm in the twilight of mine. Probably my qualifications when I finish in a year or two will be probably in the Smithsonian Institute. But anyway. I welcome you all to this industry, hope that you uh, find it beneficial in the future and it provides all the rewards you want. Uh, I'm fortunate enough today to have uh, uh, some very, very worthy uh, colleagues here. Uh, one is John Fields as the Line Maintenance Manager of Air Lingus. The other one is Richard Hoth, from, uh, he's the Executive Vice President of ELFC down in uh, Shannon. And then I've got Donald Rogers uh, with Chief Executive Officer of Dublin Aerospace Tom Caffey, head of uh, Caffrey, I should say, head of process improvement at Lufthansa Technique, and uh, Lufthansa Technique is a, uh, a uh, or we're a customer. AOS is a customer of Lufthansa Technique, so we're very, very close. Same as Dublin Aerospace, we're uh, close to them as well. And then we've got Tom, uh, who's a global business development of CAA and Park Aviation. We use Park Aviation uh, for ferrying our aeroplanes around the world uh, as and when we need them. So. I'm familiar with all these folks and these, uh, these companies. So without any further ado, what I'll do is I'll just go back to the, to the panel. I'll ask all of them to uh, introduce themselves time, uh, one at a time so that you can understand what their background is in the industry and where they've come from and what they're currently doing at the moment. And then we'll launch into uh, several issues or topics that we think may be relevant to you, uh, to you good folk today. Uh, we'd welcome questions at the end of it. Uh, the audience is uh, it's here for you. And uh, hopefully we can provide a little bit of insight and uh, information uh, for you along the way. So thank you. Um, my name is Tony Maher, um, Business Development Director for uh, CAE Park Aviation and Sanctuary. Uh, my original background, I started in the Air Corps Apprenticeship uh, Mechanic, um, developed my skills there to uh, work in, uh, in, on the helicopter side of maintenance and maintenance management and equally uh, uh, operated for 14 years on the helicopter search and rescue side of things. I was that uh, dope on the rope uh, for uh, a good number of years. Uh, moved over, left the, the military into uh, civilian life where um, I'm now working with CAE in terms of recruitment and uh, service management to, this, to the aviation industry. I'm Tom Caffrey. Um, uh, I'm currently the, the Head of Aviation Services uh, in at Lufthansa Technique in Shannon, formerly Shannon Aerospace. Um, and I started my career uh, at 17, um, taking a duty call. My dad was a civil servant, so I was an executive officer. Uh, lasted two weeks to discover I, I hated that, so I would encourage you to try and figure out what it is you really, really like to do uh, and pursue that. Um, then I went into the Army as a, a cadet, um, and uh, I, part, of, part of my training was to go to a university uh, and uh, undertook uh, electronic engineering uh, in its, its pioneer days. We were just coming out of valve technology, um, so it was, it was high tech and the army were struggling with spending EU budgets, so bought fantastic new uh, Dauphin helicopters, so Tony and I uh, served together there, uh, and with the electronic engineering, um, learned lots, lots about real engineering, real life uh, problems that wasn't going to spoil the production line, but there was dopes on the ropes and people's lives to be saved. So we, we had some, some really, really good uh, hands-on learning and um, 
then Shannon Aerospace was set up uh, in 1992, so uh, I took a, a sortie into um, the civil side of the business. Um, and uh, like has been said by the earlier speakers, uh, I started in uh, one job and moved pretty much through all the jobs uh, in the, the business. Um, went through the different business cycles from boom to struggling with uh, the challenge that brings to having to um, transform the company using lean and process improvement. And I would encourage all of you uh, to, to, to get a good understanding for that because that's, that's really hot property and very, very practical. Um, uh, the learning we had from that misfortune of having to transform our company, uh, I took to uh, Lufthansa Technique Europe in standardizing um, the business, the way we leaned uh, the business in Shannon, and pretty much that's the shape it takes uh, as, as it currently go, uh, grows. Um, so that's probably enough uh, for me. Yeah, it's uh, Donald Rogers here. I'm Chief Executive Officer of uh, Dublin Aerospace MRO out at the airport. My background is that I'm a boring old accountant. That's my training. That's where, where I qualified. Worked for a number of different companies in, in Ireland and the UK and joined the first aviation company back in 2001, about nine months before 9-11. And that was Pegasus Airlines in Turkey as CFO. Um, stayed there about five years and then went to Mexico as part of the startup team of the low cost carrier there, Viva Airbus. Um, transferred across as CFO there and then was appointed CEO in 2009. Um, moved back to Dublin then to take up the position of CEO of Dublin Aerospace. And most people ask me why I moved back to Dublin. I moved back for the weather. That's, that's why. <laughs> okay. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, good, morning. good morning, Richard Hock. Um, I'm Head of Technical for Engine Lease Finance Corporation. Um, my position also involves corporate responsibility for IT. Um, my origins in aviation go back to 1990. Um, I came out of school in late 88, didn't have a great leave and cert, had enough, but not enough to get to college then, didn't know what I wanted to do, so I went back and did it again because I thought I was young enough to play rugby, failed at that, but got through school second time round and didn't want to go to college still. So took a temporary job waiting for something to come up and this advertisement came up for Shannon Aerospace, a new startup. And that was in April 1990. <clears throat> I was lucky enough to be successful, got on board there and um, <clears throat> spent seven years at Shannon Aerospace working on the tools, the aircraft maintenance technician, um, team leader moving on to certifying. A um, lot of opportunities then, it was a fresh greenfield site, a huge growth. Um, so you, you know, in, in positions that it took normally years to get into in other established organizations, those positions there to be filled. So if you applied yourself, worked hard, studied at it, you got on. And so did that for seven years. And um, then in 97, I swapped the stamp and a toolbox um, and an office environment of 500 plus people on a hangar floor with rivet guns and everything else that runs at 100 decibels to an office of four people with a laptop and a phone. A uh, bit of a culture shock when I joined Engine Lease Finance. Uh, it was an office of four people then. We had about 15, 16 engines. Um, been there for the last 18 years. Combination of technical sales, sales support roles, uh, developed as the company moved along. Um, we now have about 270 engines and 60 employees, most of them based in Shannon. Uh, and as I said, my current role now is reporting to the CEO responsible for technical and IT. That's pretty much what I got to hear. Thank you. John. Good morning, my name is John Fields. I'm the line maintenance manager in Erlingus. I started my career um, I graduated from DCU in 2004 with a mechanical engineering degree. I joined SR Technics at the time, which uh, in a role of hangar engineering support and supporting the shops. SRT were quite proactive in taking in graduates at the time and had a good graduate programme. From SRT I progressed into Aer Lingus in 2008 in the, the engineering department looking after aircraft systems, aircraft interiors, aircraft transactions in and out of the business. Um, I worked there and then the, I progressed up to the role of engineering manager or camo manager as it's known, looking after part M, part M compliance, aircraft transactions in and out of the business and supporting line maintenance. And then 12 months ago the opportunity came uh, looking after line maintenance. So I transferred across to the, instead of the management side of the business, to, to doing the work side of the business, which is unique for me in coming from a graduate background. 
my current role historically was always filled by, you know, someone goes in as an apprentice, progresses to supervisor, shift controller, and all to line maintenance manager. So I'm looking after maintenance now um, of just over 200 people, at, you know, across the world and not having actually worked on airplanes. So it's a, it's a challenge and it highlights there is opportunity to move around the business. And it just a thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, John. As you can see, there's a, uh, uh, a vast and varied uh, background here uh, with the panel, uh, whether it be military, whether it be business, whether it be commercial or whether it be technical. So uh, I feel that we're uh, well qualified to uh, contribute to uh, uh, the, uh, the discussion today. And uh, what we've, we've, we've spoken amongst ourselves and we've, we've raised several uh, questions or topics that we, we would like to use as uh, uh, discussion points. And I'll address those with each of the, the different panel, panel members. And then at the end, please feel uh, free to sort of welcome any questions. We would welcome any questions. And it's, it's your forum, so please ask the questions. Don't be backwards in coming forwards. So, look, perhaps if we could just sort of start off, uh, Tom, if, if you could perhaps give us an overview of the industry, the MRO uh, position, both in Ireland and in Europe more generally. Okay. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll do my best, and uh, uh, like all good packs of cigarettes, I'll give the health warning. I'm happy to share with you um, my view, sure. what I've learned, what I think. Um, I, I'm not going to assert that it's right, um, uh, and perhaps it, it may provide um, a good, good opportunity for, for debate. Um, uh, and as well, I would just like to, to commend the organisers for this. Uh, it's phenomenal. Um, I, I wasn't sure uh, what type of event I was going to come to, but uh, this, this, this is really, really top end, very professional. And to have the vision and go and set it up, I just really commend uh, you guys. And I hope you people that are here just today uh, support those. Um, and when you're aviation leaders in the future, that you continue to support them. So, the, yeah. so um, a, a very broad um, topic, the, 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 the state of aviation and MRO, Ireland and Europe. Uh, I, I, I declared my hand as a, a guy who got infected by the lean bug um, and lean causes me to jump back to the customer in all situations. Uh, so when we're looking at the industry, uh, what customers do we serve? We serve the, the traveling public, and by and large, the traveling public are experiencing um, probably a, an unprecedented um, sense of well-being uh, at the moment. Things are good. There are exceptions, of course. Um, Greece, uh, Spain, some other parts of Europe uh, struggling somewhat. Um, uh, China, Russia, uh, struggling a little bit, but the sense of well-being is good. The disposable income is good. The uh, interest in travel um, and moving commodities around in freight using uh, air transport, uh, that's good. That spills over to the um, airlines. Uh, and again, uh, we heard it from our lingus today, you know, it's, it's, it's really good. So things are buoyant uh, generally for the airlines and I wouldn't bank it um, because uh, with that I think I saw a lot of, of knowledgeable heads uh, nodding um, but yet uh, I just looked at the, the papers and uh, Air France we see a guy getting his shirt torn off on the news uh, they're about to shed 4,000 jobs uh, while things are, are really so buoyant um, Malaysia, we know about their misfortunes shedding uh, 6,000 jobs. And Russia, it's very unfortunate. And Transair on the 15th of December will cease operating with 11,000 jobs. So uh, the, the message is, how is the industry? It's extremely buoyant. Um, and the caution is, let's none of us uh, get too complacent uh, about that. So that's where the airlines are. The manufacturers are responding to that. Um, uh, and things are uh, up overall, but did get a shake in the last quarter of this year, um, probably with some of what's going on with their customers. Um, and uh, Airbus down a little bit, Boeing uh, up a little bit, um, Bombardier up a little bit, uh, Embraer down a little bit. But 
overall still good news for those of us in the industry uh, and buoyant. And the uh, leasing uh, business um, pretty much booming, but also uh, figures the, the, the values of the aircraft static, um, but the number of transactions down a little bit in Q3. Uh, in case I sound like an expert, I cheated. Um, I went and had a look to see what was the news. So that was my, my grab, uh, and that's why I have some of these uh, pages. But just to put it into context for where uh, I, I think it is, the MRO industry, tends to be the lag. We catch whatever falls uh, out of the rest of the chain. Um, we don't get the, the jollies um, until the others have had them, utilize the assets, and then they fall to us. Um, but even in, our, in that situation, um, and in a, a very conservative organization like Lufthansa and Lufthansa Technique, the sense is, and the good news is, um, that things are, are pretty, pretty buoyant. So. Um, Coming into the industry uh, at this time, it's a brilliant time. Uh, it really is a brilliant time. Um, it's great that you come here uh, hungry with um, enthusiasm. Please do bring your questions and please don't just leave it today. I know you should all be in lecture halls today and you're out, that's okay. Um, do something with it. Um, please follow up. The, the stands that are out there, um, they'll be gone tomorrow but the companies that are behind it won't um, ask the questions. Um, and, and even better for us, uh, I urge you, bring some proposals. Um, I've been asked, uh, can we have a certain number of internships? Uh, the answer I gave was, possibly, what are you proposing? So uh, listen today, see what's going on, see what your own traits and talents are, and uh, I would encourage you, please, uh, for, for our little company anyway, um, do follow up. So, uh, where are we, to get back to the question, Lance, um, you. before you tell me, uh, where, where are we? We're in a buoyant industry. Um, we need to be very, very careful, um, uh, and like Fiona said, uh, agile uh, in terms of how we as corporations, um, businesses, and you as individuals um, uh, uh, prepare yourselves because it, it can be just an environment uh, weather uh, incident can absolutely shock the industry. Uh, it can be an act of terrorism, it can be a disease, um, it can be an economic crash that will take all of those trends and shake them. So uh, I'll say it again, it is very buoyant and none of us can rest on our laurels. We need to, to really see um, what's over the horizon um, and how do we best prepare for it as corporations and uh, as individuals. But uh, things are looking really, really very, very, very buoyant. Um, I would look at Ireland and say that, uh, to my knowledge and in our part of the business, the uh, consumers are very, very cost-focused. And we're in a location that we're competing with other areas that are better positioned than us uh, in terms of cost. So I would say that we really need to be focusing on delivering value uh, for the customers uh, and a value um, that, we, that, that, that our cost uh, can support. So that means getting really very close to uh, our customers, anticipating their needs um, and getting out there and making those proactive proposals for them. Don't tell them how you can respond to what they're asking everybody else for. And that's you guys as products uh, for yourselves. Uh, go out there, tell them the opportunity that you have to bring them further, uh, or how you can anticipate their, their future needs. And that's what we need to do uh, in terms of, uh, of our business. Um, again, other things and, uh, 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 that we need to look at is changing, changes in the industry. Um, the built-in quality is phenomenal. Like our cars, my car used to have to be serviced every 3,000 hours or, or 3,000 miles, and I never missed it because I was petrified that it would just let me down. Um, now my car doesn't see a 
garage for 20,000 miles. So too for the airplanes. That has huge impact um, for the different players in the industry. Whether we're owners, maybe that's a good thing. And when we're emeralds, mm, that doesn't feel like a good thing. But we have to deal with it. We have to respond uh, to it. I think that that's very important. Um, I've been hearing about seasonality uh, in our industry, but uh, our emeralds have been full all year round, including through the summer, despite the fact that I would hire guys like you, telling them it's a great industry because you're going to have very long summer holidays, and I never delivered. Well, this year I did. The airlines are really getting it together. Uh, they're keeping them aloft, and uh, our hangar, hangar is now, because I've, I've acquired another hangar to, to care for the, the lease industry. Um, they were pretty empty, and we had to be very creative in terms of uh, how, we, how we deal with that. Um, the, uh, demand for young airplanes um, is certainly uh, a trend we're seeing here in Europe, but um, we're moving airplanes to India now, to Indigo, and they want airplanes, if they're not new, they want them like new. Um, so that has an impact, and the only break guys, the garages like us in the MRO business are getting is on fuel, which makes um, the older equipment much more attractive. And before Lance falls off the, the stage, uh, that's a bit about how is the uh, industry. Okay. Thank you. I Thanks. could go on. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, can I perhaps direct the next question to uh, uh, Richard, if I may? Richard, what we've discussed before, I mean, relative to OEMs, MR, uh, original equipment manufacturers, the MROs, the leasing business, the financial institutions, what en des uh, design engineering organisations, what sort of job opportunities are there for, for students? Yeah, I mean, look, this is really what you guys want to come in here uh, about job opportunities and where you can go and where you can take your education. Um, as an engineer, I'll just compartmentalise it into a little structure, okay? You, you start at the beginning, so people manufacture the stuff. You don't have much of that in Ireland, okay? You don't have Boeing, you don't have Airbus. You have some level of very low-level subcontract, but you don't have much by way of manufacturing of new, new aircraft or parts of new aircraft. Um, you have people who fly them, so you have airlines. They do a lot of flying, so there are opportunities within airlines, and I'll just touch on the disciplines in a second. Then you've got the fixers, you've got MRO facilities who repair those, and you need a lot of disciplines for that as well. Then there's a third F, which is the financiers, and I would group together the financial institutions and the lessers here, because you, you, to think like a lesser, you effectively manage money in the form of metal. That's what you do. You manage the asset and you maintain the assets value and you try to maximize the assets value and get as much return for the investors at the end of that assets life. So after you get through the three Fs of those and the manufacturers, you do need to have regulation. So you've got the aviation authorities, and particularly the aviation authority, IA in Ireland. Then there's the other. And the other really is where you start getting into their disciplines, you get into the support structures. Um, and you have some of these within organizations and a lot of them through service providers outside. So you've got legal services. So you don't necessarily have to have an engineering background, but it's useful if you want to go into you know, even aviation law, aviation management. Certainly if you go working with leasing, you'd be working with contracts a lot. Uh, they're very technical contracts, but they're contracts nonetheless, and they have a legal structure. So you've got legal support, you've got technical services support, and there's a lot of these companies growing around the place, and a lot of them come from people who would have worked within MRO organizations before, they either retire, they move early out of those, and they say, okay, I'll do consultancy. And they tend to do consultancy because of the relationships they have with people within the leasing community. And the leasing business, which is where I come from, is very, very big in Ireland. Globally, it is really where we stand out in terms of the products that we bring to aviation, in terms of new growth, new companies coming in. You've got six or seven of the top leasing companies in the global uh, aviation sector have either headquarters or major offices based in Ireland. Uh, unfortunately for me, living in the western of Ireland, I'd like to see more of them there. They tend to gravitate towards the east coast. Um, I can just, a slight anecdote, it would be a lot easier to get to work in Shannon this morning than it was to get up to Dublin here and into the city centre. But be that as it may. Um, so you have all these support sectors and, and disciplines. The disciplines is what come into it. You know, a lot of, most of you guys are coming from an engineering background. Yes, there's a lot of engineering opportunities within the airlines. They have got big engineering divisions. They do their own maintenance. They design layouts, they, they need to involve, they need to negotiate, or not negotiate, but they need to discuss, I suppose they negotiate with the aviation authorities uh, and with the customer fronting people. The MROs do all that as a service, it's mostly engineering. Leasing companies have large engineering sections. By global leasing company standards, engine lease finance is small. 
We have about 60 people. We do engine leasing, so it's spare engine leasing. It's quite niche. But of the 60 people, 15 are engineers. So it's a technical department of 15 people. And uh, that's 25% of the workforce because it's asset management and maintaining asset value. Um, big complement is also the legal division. So there's a lot of aviation people uh, that are focused on aviation law and supporting that. And, and even though we have a strong engineering technical division, we also do a lot of support for, or we take a lot of support from those independent companies that I mentioned, those engineering companies who provide asset management services, particular on-site support services, inspections and stuff like that. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's other bespoke businesses that come into it, but we could be here all day talking about it. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. But perhaps the next question is the... Uh uh, and if I can direct that to you, Tony, the uh, uh, forecasting future employment requirements. We heard that you know, the airlines are, are using the aircraft more efficiently now, the uh, maintenance intervals are becoming longer, the product's becoming more reliable in service. Uh, do you have any...? Yeah, that, that certainly will have a, a, an impact on uh, recruitment um, into the future. I suppose it's very, very difficult you know, for the likes of... Uh, you know, um, um, you know, MROs to, to predict when they're, you're, you're trying to react to the normal cycles of aviation, which are pretty up and down um, anyway. Uh, but equally then, from a training perspective, which is what you're interested in, is that suddenly you make a large investment in training and suddenly just when, the, when that comes to fruition, you hit a downturn. And, you know, so it, it, it's very hard to manage that. It's very hard to predict it. I think that uh, if we were having this conversation 18 months ago here in Ireland, it would be a very, very different conversation insofar as that. Uh, I would think that, you know, that the class of 2015, 2016, definitely the shoe was on, very much on the other foot. Um, I think that um, uh, students and potential employees certainly are more in the position where they interview employers rather than employers interviewing them. Um, and I think that individuals should I'm not saying should absolutely take that arrogant approach, but um, I think that uh, there's a certain buoyancy around uh, the recruitment of, of talent at the moment. Um, you know, how, how that is, is happening, I suppose, aviation is really no different to most sectors insofar as that graduate recruitment is, is, is more or less an in-house function and, and the concentration. Um, um, I suppose when, you were, when we were talking, a part of the earlier discussions equally, that. Um, the number of graduates that are coming into into the aviation industry, you know, it, it, companies seem to be talking in ones and twos and threes and fours. But I, I think what um, you need to take away from this today is that um, is that there are so many different particular functions within aviation that you can you can target. You know, coming from a, a recruitment, basically a recruitment company, but now a broader services company. You know, over the course of the last 10 years, I would have recruited for legal, finance, um, statistical, you know, that's even before you ever get to uh, uh, functions like, uh, you know, on the technical side. And even that has a myriad of di different functions. Um, you know, the issues and the organization around it, I suppose, um, smaller companies, you know, and I suppose I would take in and leave it to someone else maybe to comment, that smaller companies really struggle with trying to dedicate their own time and effort to give people what is real work and challenging experience because you, you are effectively draining from their current operation to teach someone. So you have to kind of help yourself in that regard. Um, and I think um, I was talking to Ono Driscoll of CIT earlier on and he kind of said it, it's almost you have to get to a point where someone takes an interest. You know, and in ones and twos, but that requires you, individuals like yourself take responsibility to make those contacts and try and push yourself um, into those opportunities. Um, I would say too that at the moment, uh, I heard this morning where some, someone had asked the questions in Turgia, I think it's hugely important that you focus on your co-op um, placement opportunities within, within your college placement. You know, don't take the attitude that, look, it's eight months away from college and I, I, you know, I, my dad and mum will be off my back because I might be off the payroll at home. You know, the real issue is, is that it's a real opportunity for you to make an impression with a potential employer. Or equally important, if they don't have an opportunity, is that they become the conduit for hopefully a good recommendation that if you make a good impression, that you are, are already becoming part of uh, the aviation network. 
So, you know, I, you know, what are the developments? You know, it's all I would say to you in terms of trying to sell aviation. It's statistically a fact that every 15 years since 1970, aviation has doubled in size. That's just, so if I was to try and sell an industry to you, take that on board. And I would say over the next 15 years, it will, it will, it will more than double. That's my prediction anyway. Thank you. Perhaps, uh, the next question could be to, uh, directed to, uh, again, uh, Tom, uh, relative to, uh, again, from the MRO background and or perhaps even from the airline background, so what, well, other panel members to, to comment as well. But you know, what about automation in the future? We've heard that the, the reliability of the products are longer, the maintenance intervals are longer, the lesser, uh, not the uh, operators using the aeroplane a lot more efficiently. Uh, do you see you know, uh, work practices affecting the MRO business or even the engine overhaul business? Or um, I would, to say no would be complacent. Yeah. Um, but we do an uh, environmental scan every year uh, in our company just to see you know, where are we doing well, where are we not doing well, what are the opportunities and what are the threats. Um, and automation would be something that we're looking at. Um, and cautiously, we're not seeing it as a, as a current threat to uh, MRO and uh, particularly to the airframe side of it. Um, the, but automation is coming in more and more um, in the manufacturer. So we see uh, that, that that may well spill over. And if it's to spill over into the MRO, um, it may be with the new materials, so the airplanes being uh, less metal airplanes and more composite, uh, and more integrated composite where they're putting sensors and uh, wires uh, to condition monitor the different parts of the structure, the skin and other parts. Could that lead to uh, automation? Possibly. Um, Self-scanning, self-sensing, identification, please replace me rather than please inspect all of me. Um, but uh, Boeing are finding out some of that uh, is still quite primitive with the, the 787. The reliability is low. Um, to uh, automate um, otherwise um, would be pretty much very capital intensive. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, how many uh, customers would be happy to pay for that at the moment. Um, an area where automation is already uh, in the cockpit is in self-diagnostics. So the airplanes are pretty good at telling the crew uh, how they are and if there's uh, something wrong with them. Um, but that's more for the ability to dispatch the airplane to, to carry out its sortie. Um, for deeper maintenance, again, I think we're still a ways away. Um, and uh, I, I have a particular interest in the, the 787 because we're weighing it up and see if that's a, an actual successor for us with the, the 767 maintenance. Um, uh, and while on the, the book, I, I, I didn't see if there's anyone here from Boeing. I, I, I hope not. Um, because uh, it's an open forum. It, 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 it doesn't really work yet. Um, uh, I was in Thompson's hangar and the, um, the self-test on the flight controls takes 45 minutes to run. It doesn't tell you and your maintenance crew that you're paying for and can't leave the airplane because it's like a horse. You don't know where it's going to kick or bite you. Um, uh, uh, and only after the 45 minutes does it tell you, uh -uh. Sorry. And the instruction is, do the test again. Um, so now that sounds, hearing myself in the background, that sounds like a smug, complacent git. Uh, no, we need to be really, really uh, aware that uh, either uh, automation or redundancy in terms of the uh, amount of maintenance uh, required could seriously uh, impact uh, on our business. But I'm not seeing it coming in. The other area that's pseudo-automation, um, where there's huge potential, and I hope somebody really grabs it fast, is in the uh, application of IT for the documentation. We're so highly regulated, it's so important. Um, and for the MRO industry, uh, a huge amount of inefficiency goes around uh, what work is actually required. Uh, how can we plan for it? Rather than making discoveries when the airplane is on the ground and not 
flying the passengers around the place. We're making discoveries and then we're ordering parts or we're dealing with it. When the data, and I think it was uh, Fiona again um, mentioned it, uh, it's out there. Um, towns, cities are using big data. Why can't our industry use yeah. it? Uh, and really find out the condition of the airplane. Really find out the uh, fingerprints of every single component, no matter how small, um, so that we can plan much more effectively, much better. Um, and the amount of dirty fingerprints that's generated during the MRO activity is colossal. Uh, I think that there's huge potential for um, pseudo automation uh, yeah. in that. Um, uh, I, 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 I agree. Think yeah. in, in effect, you'll see that the, the jobs will shift to different jobs. Yeah. I don't think there will be a reduction in job levels, I think, which was kind of the question equally. It's just that people will be, you, you will be looking at more data analysis and what you're going to do with the data. So that requires a different uh, skill. Mm. Yeah. John, you've, you've got the lawn yeah, maintenance the, environment. Yeah. Well, particularly the, the software management. Like, you know, at the moment, we get a, a box for a particular avionics system, and it's for that system. You put it in, you do a function check, and away the aircraft goes. The way it is going forward, you have a box, a hardware box with no software. So the box can be used in various systems, and you put on the particular software, you know, onto whichever application you have. So from our point of view, kind of you know, the software management, the network management, these aircraft aren't mechanical systems; they're like an IT network. So it's transitioning the skills of a, a B1 mechanical and a, a B2 avionics traditional engineer to manage an IT platform, essentially, with software and, you know, all these different kind of cabling technologies, which hasn't been there. And some of the technologies on aircraft, due to certification, can be way behind what we see in IT and industry. And it's only slowly catching up, but it's a skill set, I think, that needs to develop. And that the market does need is, is people, not just with the, the turning the spanner or the multimeter approach, it's the, the software and the IT approach is critical as well. D does Air Lingus uh, provide uh, laptops, or not, uh, tablets, I should say, to, yeah. to the line mechanics? Is it, you, I often travel through sort of Europe, or I know, I'll use Germany as an example, or the US. The mechanic on the line now has a, uh, has a tablet, yeah. and all the data entry is going into that, and the aeroplane goes away, and there's virtually no paperwork. Yeah. So it, it starts off, obviously, in the aircraft. We've switched over to e-techlog on the aircraft, so the crew are fully, you know, the, the big nav bag is gone. But from our side, yeah, for sure, access to data is a problem. Historically, you know, in our case, Airbus would give you PDF manuals and Word manuals. They don't. It's all, you know, it's, it's programming type now. So we do have access via tough pads and via iPads to maintenance data on the aircraft. But for sure, we do struggle with it. We're ac accessing, you know, to a, a basic IT network. It's not, it's a little bit clunky now, but we need to get up to speed where we can make the data available in a usable interface. If you're going from a desktop to a touch screen and trying to use a desktop based click with a mouse on a touch screen, it doesn't really work. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're kind of manipulating systems to work on a, a remote yeah. device. But like in the last two years, we have the line maintenance guys have access to data at the aircraft. Okay. Like we don't have the MEL on board anymore. There used to be a paper MEL, yeah. there's none now. You have to have an iPad. So okay. it's having the skill sets to manage that data correctly is important. Right. Yeah. Whilst you're on the floor, uh, perhaps the next question can go to you, which is to do with, uh, uh, have you got any advice for the students relative to uh, uh, what sort of skills they require, perhaps to be considered for employment with the airline or the MRO? Should it be purely a technical qualification or do you consider it beyond that now, a technical qualification, or is it becoming a prerequisite beyond a technical yeah. qualification as well? Obviously we're all biased because we're the maintenance side, but for sure, yeah. if, if you look, we all talk in flight cycles and flight hours, and if you consider an aircraft doing a flight cycle, in our case from, we'd say, Dublin to Heathrow, we all get on every day and it's like a bus service. But if you think of the number of inputs, from the guy servicing the water, to the guy service, signing the CRS, to the cabin crew, the pilots, the support areas, the baggage handling, the people who set the prices for the flight, the flight planners, the ATC, we're all looking at the end product of a passenger sitting on a seat. But there's a multitude of support services where we all can work in aviation. Now, us being kind of biased towards technical, the logical input is through a, an engineering support area or a tech services area or an internship in the technical side. But the message has to be, don't stay still. Once you get in the door, you get the basic understanding of the business, you know, move around. 
don't think it's going to be your future necessarily in where you enter. Like in my case, I went from the camo side to the maintenance side, the 145. But likewise, there's opportunities in ground operations in Air Lingus. There's opportunities in flight ops. So take every opportunity as a case to move on. If you want to progress to be an accountable manager or a senior manager in an airline or in a leasing company, the more knowledge you have across the business is fantastic. Our current CEO, Stephen Kavanagh, he has been across the Air Lingus business, and you won't spin a yarn or you won't sell something wrong or you won't try and hide something because he knows the business. So the message is get across the business, get as much information as you can. But from the maintenance side, what having recruited a number of interns and uh, graduate positions, some of the skill sets which I think could be valuable and which you could add to your, your knowledge base to help the process is a basic understanding of the regulation. Now, as simple as it may seem, you know, some people in the industry 20 years don't understand 145, 66, part M, where it all sits. So if you can get a clear understanding of the regulation, where day one you know, okay, that guy in aircraft systems is looking after the part M side of the house, the guy changing the wheel is the 145, understand where all the roles sit. That's critical from my point of view. And also, the main thing we use is a computer system called AMOS. So four of the main five AOC holders in Ireland use AMOS. So if someone has an IT skill that's applicable to your system, it's a good chunk of the CV. The door is opened a bit further. So there's a number of main systems from an airline, MRO side, there's AMOS and there's TRAX and there's SAP. So any knowledge of those systems that you can gain certainly would definitely help in the, in the application process for, for a position, certainly in our area. It all gets back to the ongoing training. No matter what you do, there's always sort of, whether it be type training for purely for a mechanic, Absolutely. it just goes on and on for years and years and years. I mean, I talk from a leasing company perspective uh, at the moment, but uh, we, we have fellows that are, uh, whether be, they be, uh, that work in, in sort of my team, that they uh, they're could have been, had a trade apprenticeship to start with, or the uh, qualified graduates. They've all gone and done MBAs, or they've all got financial qualifications as well, because from a leasing perspective, we require, it's more, whilst it's, it's important to know how the aeroplane works and have an understanding of that and, and what arises, but it's becoming equally important in this business today, and I, I'd suggest even across the airline, everybody has to be cost conscious and have an understanding of where the costs are or what the costs could be. And qualifications going that way are just, I shouldn't say becoming mandatory, that, that's a bit harsh, but it, there's definitely a trend developing. I don't know whether you guys agree or not, but yeah. For sure, like some of the, um I myself did an MBA last year purely to develop me personally yeah. as a more favourable team member in the managing yeah. group going forward. But even down to the, the guys, the engineers on the floor, there's various de developments coming in aircraft and test systems and there's always a learning. You have the regulatory continuous learning every two years, which has all the lessons learned and the events and how we can improve safety. But that combined with the, the emerging technologies, is, it's a constant learning piece. Yeah. But the other piece as well, which is important, and Fiona touched on it, is the, the cross-departmental teamwork. You know, some of the pilots might know what the engineer has to do and vice versa. Okay. And it's nearly sometimes a light bulb moment when you sit with someone doing their job and your job can affect them so much and not realise what they're trying to do. Yeah. So cross-departmental, and it's something Air Lingus we're, we're trying to push through various interface meetings and, you know, get to know the roles. But, the engineering function actually does impact across the, the various areas. D Donald, you've, you've got a, a, a developing business. I mean, Dublin Aerospace, whilst it's been around for a, for a few years now, it's, it's That's evolving. It. Do you have an, an opinion on this as well as far as qualifications or MBAs or using um, them as an example? Yeah, it, 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 so from our point of view, I, I could answer that question, yes, no, and maybe, right, yeah. as regards an MBA. I think from, from our point of view, the, the most important quality from any student coming in or apprentice or trainee is their attitude. That's, that's the first thing that will make or break uh, a, a career within Dublin Aerospace. Attitude is, is the important, the ability to, to be flexible, um, to get up and go with things and to absorb the knowledge. Even if you've spent three or four years in college doing a degree, accept that you know, there are 50 year old guys who've never been to college working for us who know more about the aircraft than you think you know, and to accept that because there's a willingness to pass that on. Particularly for us, as regards um, recruitment, we go the apprenticeship route, and that's purely because our, our, our engineering is subcontracted um, out of the organisation, so we don't have much of a 
an opportunity for graduates to come in. It's mainly apprentices and trainees. Um, my advice on the MBA, it is important as you progress through your career. Personally, I don't look at it as, as mandatory when I'm looking at recruiting people. Um, but I think your first priority should be to get experience. You need to get the practical experience. Um, and I would say if you've done a degree, the experience is the next most important thing to get before you start looking at an MBA. Because I think the MBA will help you later on when you've had that experience, you've worked in the company, mm -hmm. you've worked in any of the companies here, um, and it'll help you develop as well. Um, and I think the MRO business for us, it's, it's a sounding board for a lot of careers in other industries as well. Um, if, if people who've worked in MROs um, that have moved on to be CEOs of airlines, uh, worked, it, it, they've moved to leasing companies, so it's actually a very valuable <coughs> qualification. Um, so I suppose, not being a politician, I'll answer your question. To, to us, somebody coming along with an MBA does not give them an advantage. Mm. Their attitude is the first thing, yeah. their qualification, and then later on in their mm. career, as they have the experience, I think the MBA is when that yeah. should kick in. That's yeah. our view. Yeah. Yeah. Having, sorry, I mean, having just done an MBA 12 months ago, the whole MBA, the assignments, the projects, it's all based on your work experience. So you need to have the work knowledge to yeah. develop your MBA. So I think, as Donald says, do your degree, get your experience, put the foundations in, and then the next level is the transaction via MBA if necessary. Yeah. Uh, just as a final example, yeah. I said at the start I worked in Mexico, and when we were recruiting staff, general staff within the organization, um, and, and I'll take HR as an example, we interviewed a number of people, we appointed somebody in particular, and within six months of him joining, he asked me the question, he said, um, why did you pick me? I didn't have an MBA. Because in, 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 in that country, there was, there was a mentality you had to have an MBA to actually get a decent job. But then the MBA was undervalued, devalued, because there was all sorts of suspect MBAs out there. So the quality of, of where you do the MBA is important as well. So mm. I just yeah. take that uh, into account. And, and I, I did mention MBA. Perhaps I should have qualified it a bit further. It wasn't necessarily an MBA alone. It was it's more, it could be a financial qualification. I mean, I have one fellow that's working for me. He's just completed a master's in finance as well, albeit he's an undergraduate similar to you. Or he's a graduate, I should say, similar to you folk. Uh, so not necessarily MBA alone, but yeah, yeah, I think we wholeheartedly agree that you've got to have the experience. The other thing is, with any form of employment, the person's got to be the right fit. And if you've got a good interview panel, you, you can generally pick the right people. Sometimes it doesn't work, but that, that's probably equally, probably equally as important, particularly for a, uh, for a graduate, uh, to understand that you know, the attitude of the individual is so important in the interview, you're going to you sort of say, there's Fred there, Fred will work, John won't. John may be more qualified or may have a better uh, academic result, but he, he may not fit the organisation. That's part to do with the culture of the organisation, and you've got to make those decisions too at the time. So, yeah. Yeah. And certainly from our experience over, you know, in recruiting graduates over the years, um, you know, the, the old adage is uh, you, you recruit character and uh, you teach skills you know so you're you're um you're you i absolutely agree 100 percent that the feedback i get from from companies as as we place people with them you know based on the fact that you take it as a given they're they've graduated and they've got the basics now what's about their attitude and their motivation okay. I, I, the final thing i just say on that it's amazing the number of candidates that we interview that haven't got a clue about the company now, you might laugh, you might think that's really strange, but I've come across people who, who are actually leaving school, university graduates, they come in and they say, yeah, Dublin Aerospace has been in existence for 55, 60 years, right? Because they've read a little paragraph on the front of our website that says aviation started in this facility, you know, 50, 60, 100 years ago, but they haven't gone further than that. And that's straight away you actually have 20 minutes where you've turned off in the interview. So I'm not lecturing, but it, it is amazing and it amazes me every day when, when we're interviewing people and you've got very intelligent people coming along and they've just done the very basic, ah yeah, Dublin Airspace, we know that. But you dig deeper, they, they don't know. So I think if you are looking at opportunities, and the same goes for leasing companies, any, any company you're, you're, you're going, just do that bit of research. And that's not a five-minute research. That's a sort of, you know, spend the time in it. You spend three years in college, 
spend a bit of time researching the company and try and research the individuals within the company as well, because then you'll get a feel for what sort of culture is in there. That's me thinking. No, I, I definitely agree lecture. with you. Yeah, I mean, it's one, if, if I'm involved in an interview, it's one of the questions I say, what do you know about my current employer? And uh, if they say, oh, it's a leasing company, well, okay. Then you push it further and then you can tell within a very short period of time whether they've done any homework. What that's demonstrating, there's a desire to, uh, f for me or for the interview panel to uh, understand, is there a desire for this person to really work, for, work with us? And I just uh, add a comment to that, not to be echoing points that are already made, yeah. but to, to just even put a number in it, for us in ELF, if you get an interview, you're already technically competent for what we need. And we look at it, you recruit the person yeah. and you teach them the job. We will place 90% emphasis on the interview and the personality and the person that we're interviewing, yeah. not what actual qualification they've got. Experience will count, because it helps, but particularly when it comes to engine leasing, it's, it's a very bespoke business. So you're gonna to have to learn that business by your experience. So really what we're looking at is we're looking at the fit of the person and how they fit into the organization. And if I was gonna say the one thing that everyone should possibly bring is bring passion. Bring passion to what you want to work in because that will reflect in your CV, that will reflect in how you do your research that Donald said. If you really, really want this and you're passionate about wanting it, that will reflect in everything and how you prepare and how you come about doing that. And that's the kind of individual that we want because you know, you've seen Fergus and Fiona would have put, put points up about earlier on. You know, it's constant learning. It's not nine to five. This business is not nine to five. It's not handy you clock out and you go home. You will constantly be learning. You'll be constantly working out of hours. You will do that. It is a hard graft, but it is very rewarding for yourself and how you get on with your career. So I would just say, Focus on that and focus on constantly learning and, and bring a passion to whatever, your, whatever business or company you're going to join. I think as well, just the, you mentioned the importance of the internship and the, the kind of the intra and the placement programs. We always talk about degrees of separation, but I guarantee you the answer is always in the phone. One phone call will link everyone in the industry. It's a small industry worldwide. And the impression you make on your work placement, be it in the summer holidays or be it in a part of the, your tour year, is critical. I've seen students turning up, you know, first day, day one, jeans and a t-shirt. At least aim high the first day, figure out the dress code and work back to the rest of the, the office. But the impression is critical and it's a small industry and you put all the effort into an interview and all it takes is a phone call. Johnny was at you for six months, how was he? Not a great guy, you know what I mean? So it needs to be important yeah. that, uh, that, that That's very, very true, John. I mean, uh, this I always say to a lot, a lot of my colleagues or, or uh, it's such a small industry, even worldwide. You never want to burn a bridge in this business because someday you may have to walk back over it. Uh, and it, we still have contacts with people that you know, I, I dealt with you know, 20 years ago. I mean, they mightn't be in the same, uh, they might, I might have been in the MRO business then, but even today I'd go back to them and sort of, you'd be still, that personal contact in this business and word of mouth is, is so valuable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The point I made earlier about yeah. your co-op place. Yeah, yeah. 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 Look, uh, being conscious of time, there's just one final question, I think, to everybody, so please f uh, feel free to uh, uh, con uh, contribute. Do we industry here do enough, uh, talking to the education uh, organisations you know, with, within Ireland? Uh, do, should we do more? Uh, I mean, one of the things we discussed yesterday as a group is that when uh, how do we go about you know, recruiting an intern, say, for the summer or the fourth year, fourth year uh, uh, work experience? Uh, and we do it on an individual basis. Sometimes we get in, uh, in touch with the various institutions, but perhaps it, I think we discussed yesterday that potentially perhaps it should be a more coordinated approach and have something like a, a forum today that, you know, it's, it's a workshop. And, various people here, you've got several booths outside that you can go and talk to people, but you know, when it's coming up to that you know, work experience period, uh, perhaps it could be more coordinated, and perhaps as a suggestion to IASA, you folk, with the forum you've got today, it's an ideal platform to do something like that in the future, and it's coordinated, and instead of the ad hoc, you'd, I think it would give a lot more competition for the students to be placed, uh, but anyway, please. I think please, a great opportunity with the summer work in particular, there's always plenty of work to be done, yeah. but sometimes the system of getting someone in is just too cumbersome. Yeah. It becomes your personal problem, your two, you know, the recruitment process, the application process, your two or three months getting someone in for three months. Where if there was a process that was agreed by all the companies, 
So the boxes are ticked, the insurance is ticked, the access, the security clearance, it's all done. And our Lingus can roll it out, or the LFC can roll it out, and it just happens. It make the process, okay, if a project coming up, we need someone for six weeks, they're in this, the IASA system, and it's, it's hit the ground running, essentially. Mm. So something there, a common forum, needs to be supported by industry, but it needs mm. to definitely, there's opportunity. Do any of us interact directly with the training institutions? I mean, each of your own companies? Um, yeah, in uh, Lufthansa Technique, we have our own 147 school. So for people doing licenses and other training, we do that ourselves. Um, we sort of broke the mold when we set up um, uh, not necessarily going the apprenticeship, and apprenticeships are great. Um, we, we set up our own traineeship, and we carry that forward to the graduate because we were finding that um, graduate courses were, uh, the curriculums were put on based on the academic staff that the university had and the courses that they had uh, on the shelf. Um, so we have interacted with the university closest to us, the University of Limerick, uh, and taken a step forward. There's a lot more to go, um, but we have uh, a degree, the BSc in Aircraft Maintenance and Airworthiness Engineering. I had to check the name because it was a BTEC last year because it wasn't good enough. Um, this is better and it's not good enough. And if I'm invited back in five years and we still have that and it's MSc, it won't be good enough. Uh, mm. because it needs really to keep, pa keep pace. So um, we are I interacting uh, there. Uh, I, I hate having to look at the pharmas and the biotechs um, where the uh, universities and the government are moving towards them saying, what do you need graduates to be able to do when they join your company? And they backwork that onto the syllabus for the um, courses. Why not our industry? I, I don't get that yet. Uh, I don't have a forum, so we're just doing it ourselves on our own. Okay. Um, but, uh, Anybody else? Yeah, we, we, we interact uh, with universities, and not just UL as well. We also have Carlo RTC, and yeah. um, we've had input up with Queen's, who also do an aeronautical engineering degree. And we do keep saying to these institutions that please, uh, or establishments, please put on one or two fleet management optional modules. And they don't have to be... Uh, compulsory, they can be optional. For someone who says, you know what, I think I'd like to have a bit of business fleet management into my engineering degree, because that would also open it up more so than to people who do mechanical engineering degrees, not aeronautical engineering. Mechanical engineering, they do a couple of optional modules about anything to do with asset management. It, it, it helps. Yeah. Um, we're slowly getting there, but I do emphasize Did you think we should take a more coordinated approach? I mean, having an input? I mean, we've all got different disciplines or, or requirements. Yeah, but I, I think that, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Richard. Um, I, I think when you're looking at the industry in Ireland that there are, you know, there are one or two very big players. And then when you're asking small companies to give up their time, as uh, Fiona said, you know, mm. AWOS, you know, you know, $7 billion um, dollar company, 100 people. You know, so when you're asking comp you know, individuals to put time and effort into trying to coordinate and to do this, it's, it's asking a lot. Mm. Okay. You know, I'm not saying that effort shouldn't be made, I'm just saying it, it is difficult and can be a, a drain on, okay. on operations. Very briefly on that, I, I don't yeah. think it needs to be coordinated. Yeah. The reason being, it's actually a pretty simple question. The question is, what do you need us to provide in terms yeah. of the, the students coming out for you? It's a very easy answer. So it's either taken on board or not. So yeah. I okay. think UL are quite proactive and actually I was approached recently um, to kind of say, what do we need? And the MBA is focused on aviation. So, okay. and Carlo and UL seem to be proactive in linking in with industry, so it's I, 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 I would just add one further thing. Um, we focus on the established uh, institutions, but the world is changing, um, and the government are, are being much more agile. So they have programs set up by, uh, called skill nets, um, and the skill nets are um, focused on sectors. Um, and there's, there's a lot of funding available also to support people to upskill. Um, uh, and the skill net, there's Fenuis for leasing, there's a new skill net for uh, aerospace just being set up. And if the training that's recognized for us as employers or you as um, future leaders uh, doesn't exist, uh, ask skill nets, 
when, are, when is it going to become available? And they can come back with the right answers. So mm -hmm. I think we, we, we just need to be out of the box, um, okay. not just with the universities. Mm -hmm. I, th I think just from my point of view, and uh, th there are probably some colleges here, so I, I'll be careful what I say. Personally, I think some of the colleges have let the students down within this industry because they put on courses that will end up with a qualification, but the main part of that qualification is the practical experience. So you've done three years in college, they've made no arrangement for practical experience. Now I know students are responsible for doing that, but when they deliberately start a program and they've spoken to companies like us and they're not flexible in changing their structure or their timing of the course to suit our business, then I think that's wrong within it's the flawed. industry. Yeah. And it's, did you use the word fraud? Flawed. Flawed, I died. <laughs> <Sorry. Okay. laughs> There's bit of humor. Subtle difference between the two <laughs> words, in, in my view. And I think that, that is a shame for, for students yeah. attending universities yeah. and, and colleges. Some fantastic colleges have been mentioned here that I know about, but there are some that I think that they do need yeah. a kick from, okay. from the authorities to actually say, yeah, this is a great course to have, but it's worthless at the end of the day for the student who finishes because they can't get the experience and they think that yeah. is worth something. So. I mean, I know we value when, when we take on a, a graduate or a we value uh, looking at their work experience or the opportunities of, and when we take somebody on, you know, during this, uh, the, the work experience, I mean, we actually immerse them in the work. Uh, there's a sort of honeymoon period where they first start, but then they get proper projects and all the rest of it, and uh, that, that's worked out well for us, and it provides a, a level of support to us. And we try to immerse them as much as possible, and we give them, we've given some students, you know, GenFam Boeing or Airbus GenFam training. We send them over to Airbus or Boeing or whatever it may be, but we also give them a lot of training um, in in house as, as much as possible. So, yeah, look, I think because we are running behind, look, questions from the floor, please, at your forum, please ask. Donald there, what makes uh, Ireland an attractive place to run an MRO company from, as a CAO's perspective? Ooh, that's an easy question, isn't it? Um, I mean, from, from our point of view, the, the history of, you know, the manpower, the, the, the knowledge that's there in the country in aviation um, was a big factor when Dublin Aerospace set up operation following the closure of SRT. So the pool of people that was there, um, Yes, it's, it's a higher uh, cost country than some of the other options that are available, but I think you, you, you can actually get that back through the efficiency of people as well. There is great dedication within the workforce to the quality of the products that they're delivering, but there's also the customer interface as well. They see the customer as somebody who's paying their wages. So it's, it's unusual to get technical people, and I'm not insulting anyone here, but it's unusual to get technical people, mechanics, who actually understand that the end customer pays wages. Um, and Dublin as a, as a location, unlike Shannon, it's actually very attractive to foreign people um, you. who, uh, <laughs> you know, who actually come over and they, they might spend three or four months here, you know, managing an aircraft or whatever. The, the, the reaction to Dublin has actually been very positive, never any negative reaction. But I think it was the historic um, build-up of, of um, the labour force um, in the country um, and, and we're continuing that, and so are the other companies actually redeveloping that for the younger generation as well. My question is actually for um, Richard Arlant. This is myself. I'm, uh, I finished my level 7 degree last year. I'm doing my level 8 degree now in Carlo, but I actually have no experience. Like, what would you recommend for me if I want to do like a six month or a year long internship? in either of the companies? So what way should I go about it? Um, I don't have my HR person to give the advice on the actual the process, but I know what we do is, I mean, it's, you guys are all familiar with LinkedIn. I think most of the companies are connected on LinkedIn, LinkedIn through their HR systems. I think you've probably got to send your CV into all the, the leasing organizations or any MRO or airline that you want to get work experience with. To be honest, any, any one of those disciplines or any one of those organizations or even one of the support companies will give you valuable experience. The main thing is that you're getting experience. It doesn't have to be exactly focused on what you'd like to do afterwards. Really what you're doing is you're knocking the edges off your first few years of actually working post the qualification or even as you go through the qualification. That jumps off a CV. 
That, that, that does. So it helps a lot. So how do you go about it? I, I think it's the hard way. It, it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, you have to get your CV out in front of people. You don't badger people, but at the same time, you proactively you interact with them uh, to the extent of saying, look, if there's something coming up, please keep me in mind. And you make sure you prepare then when you get that opportunity to take it. Just to give an example that Fergus mentioned, the summer workers. We currently on our aircraft cleaning team have a guy with a level eight mechanical engineering degree. He wanted to work in aviation. He came in as a route in and he's in the cleaning team. And every effort or any chance he gets, he's over with the aid checks, he's over with the guy's maintenance. And when an opportunity comes, he will jump at it in our lingus mm. or external lingus, but yeah. he's taking the efforts to do that. Yeah. So it's Can we take a couple more questions? If, if Samuel Chanel from um, Aeronautical um, at UL. Um, a qu uh, question for the panel, quite one on the panel. Um, uh, basically, on your last discussion, you were basically um, talking about furthering your knowledge in terms of the aviation industry. Um, in terms of um, progressing onwards to uh, maybe design house or uh, part 21 industry, um, in terms, um, would you recommend, um, let's say, for instance, in UL, they offer a one year's master's degree as a way to better prepare you for such a um, role? Or would you um, recommend going into such things as um, into an organization and basically learning from there and then progressing onwards? Or which would you recommend? Just well, from my perspective, our company, we have a, um, a, a, a DOA Part 21 um, unit or within the organization, you know, and I've seen it firsthand and, well, they've only been part of the organization for the last three years, and I can see it firsthand how, how the, the length of time it, it takes to bring someone up to a skill level uh, for, for Part 21 engineering. So, you know, how useful it is for an individual to come in with a master's and then we kind of go back to the whole MBA um, discussion again. Um, I think it is one of those specific areas where you have to try and get in and you have to literally get stuck in at the bottom. You know, as, as uh, John used a lovely term yesterday, he said, you just have to find your way around. You have to learn the basics and there's no other way. And that specific one is time, doing projects with people who have far more experience than, than yourself. It is, it's, 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 it's a difficult one, but I wouldn't say that a master straight off would be advantageous. I, I, might, I might just add to that, uh, echo what you're saying. Um, it's, it's not so much for me about the, a taught program that somebody just then gets inspired with skills uh, for design engineering. Um, and because of that, it's something that we're, we're looking to um, uh, offer a structured um, traineeships uh, for graduates, um, where they can come into the operation, where they can observe for a while, where they can get a certain amount of um, training that we feel is necessary or even mandatory, um, then they can support, um, then they can contribute uh, up to a, a structured way where they can participate in the design, the issue of the, of the documentation. Um, so that's, that's something that we're, we're looking at doing. It won't be very high volume. Um, but it could be very valuable for individuals. Um, we do it for the mechanics, so we're, we're looking to do that um, for the engineers as well. Okay. Uh, look, we'll, we'll have to wrap it up there because we're running behind time. Thank you, gentlemen. Really appreciate your inputs and taking the time out today. And again, thank you to, uh, uh, to the organising committee. I'd just like to close with one final point. Uh, I came to Ireland about 30 years ago uh, on a business trip I was recruiting because Australia didn't uh, at that time, we are starting up an, an MRO in Australia and had a lot of skills and those skills, the, Australia elected not to uh, do all of that training at that stage and there was a void for about five years. So there was no training. So one of the, one of the targets that I deliberately had, one was Asia and the other one was Ireland. I came here and I took probably 30, 40 people out of Ireland because of the training, uh, the training establishment, the education system, and it's still the same today. So. You guys have the world before, or you folks have the world before you. So, thank you all.